Great. Welcome everybody to our um, May 8th uh, Imperial Microconference. I'm Wilma Hodges. I'll be moderating the session. And um, today I have the pleasure of um, talking about teaching in open source, which is a topic that's close to my heart since I have a kind of an instructional background. Um, and this is uh, this presentation is going to talk more about um, where teaching stands and explore some of those challenges um, of you know, changing education for the better. We've got a couple of great presenters with us today. Um, we have, oh, I'm sorry, I'm doing this kind of all in the wrong order. <laughs> uh, let me first start by um, just kind of giving you a preface um, a little bit about um, some of the, the work that students are doing in Sakai. Sakai is an open source LMS for those of you who aren't already aware. I'm the Sakai community manager, so this is kind of in my wheelhouse a little bit. Um, we've had a longstanding relationship with the students at Marist College, um, and they do um, all sorts of QA for us. They are also involved with accessibility, um, so they've been a great help to, um, to the Sakai community, and it's also a benefit to the students because they get real-world experience in software development, kind of seeing how it works, seeing how QA works, um, and uh, they can then take that experience with them uh, on into their their careers in the future. So um, it's been a really uh, kind of symbiotic relationship there that we've had with the folks at Marist. So that's just one example of how teaching with open source has um, impacted the Sakai LMS. Um, I just wanted to give you kind of that brief teaser and uh, and then introduce our presenters today, which um, our, our presenters are Heidi Ellis and Gregory Hishup, Hislop, um, and they're going to be talking about teaching with open source um, in their um, perspective um, areas. Heidi is a professor in computer science and information technology at Western New England University, and she's been active in software engineering education for over 20 years. She's been involved with students in humanitarian, free and open source software since 2006, and she's also been a co-PI on multiple NSF grants to support this effort. Um, and she has multiple publications and presentations related to the topic. Uh, Gregory Hislop is a professor of former and former associate dean in the College of Computing and Informatics at Drexel University. His research interests focus on software engineering practice, technology, in education and computing for social good in education. He's also been a PI on a series of NSF grants to develop um, higher ed free and open source education and broaden participation in computing. Prior to Drexel, he worked almost 20 years in the software industry. So without further ado, I'm going to um, hand off the slides here to Heidi. Let me get you back to slide one. There we go. And you should be able to take presenter now. Yep, I have it. Great. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, we're excited to be here. We're going to talk a little bit about um, teachingopensource.org and also about teaching open source in general. Um, and Wilma has done a wonderful introduction for us. So just to give a little outline, we're going to talk a little bit about why the Teaching Open Source organization was needed and then the history of that. We're going to talk about POSSE, which stands for Professors Open Source Software Experience, which are workshops for faculty to expose more faculty to open source software, um, and if, more importantly, how to teach open source to students. And then we're going to give you an update on where Teaching Open Source Source stands currently. So as an academic, my goal is to graduate my students with an understanding about how to go into the world and contribute as a software developer. Open Source is leading edge on many of the software development tools. So it's a natural for me to want my students to have an understanding of what open source software is, and more importantly, how to participate in, in it, how to contribute to it. So as an overarching goal, teaching open source wants to have students who can who have had experience 
in participating in open source software, who have an understanding of the culture and understanding of the tools and how it works. Okay. Unfortunately, <laughs> in higher education, open source is not widely taught. And this little graphic shows you. So that little diamond arrow in the middle is identifying the students who actually learn about open source development while they're in school. And again, we're going, in a minute, I'm going to talk a little bit about why this is so. But currently, there's a small group of people. And I'm hoping, I'm guessing that most of those or many of those people are here that actually have students that are, are instructing students on how to contribute to open source. What I'm talking about here is not how to use an open source tool. There are a lot of programs that are that teach Docker. Yes, I get that. And teach the use of open source tools. What I'm talking about here is conveying to students an understanding of the culture, an understanding of open source practices. On the right hand side of this figure, what we see is open source is widely used in industry. So there is a strong demand in industry for students who have an understanding of that open source culture. Some of the barriers there are to faculty, many faculty do not have experience themselves in open source software. Again, to get to become a faculty member, you typically have to do research. That research is often in a fairly specific area, which may or may not use open source software. There's pressure in academia to publish or perish. And so there's pressure for faculty to continue research. Um, and that limits the time that can go into exploring things like open source. Most open source projects and, and open source tools have a learning curve associated with them. And so being able to stay on top of even just a, a current open source project takes, again, more time. Computing is changing so rapidly, right? There's so many new things coming out. AI, yep, the typical example. So there's increasing pressure to put more in the computer science and the computing curricula. And as a result, faculty, what do we take out is the current question. So there's, it can be difficult to find a place to slide that open source in. And open source as a culture is a culture of, of experimentation, of exploration. In the open source culture, it's very accepted to say, I don't know the answer to that. Um, there, in some academic situations, faculty are expected to be the experts. They're expected to know everything. And so the idea of not being able to have all of the answers um, can be a barrier as well. So this problem of not having sufficient faculty members who were familiar with open source to be able to then educate students to become familiar with open source has been recognized for well over a decade and a half. Um, it's interesting that the people who first tried to address this issue came from the open source world. Great, kudos. Um, there was a meeting at OzCon in 2008, and that meeting highlighted the need for education to be in, for there to be additional education in open source. So Carl Fogel, who you may know from the producing open source software text, and Brian Bellendorf, who founded the Apache Group, they were key members of that meeting. And they actually took on the task and established teachingopensource.org as a domain. So established teaching open source as a group, <clears throat> as an organization. They did this in March of, 20, of 2009, and the goals there were to try to come up with educational models, figure out how to fund this, okay, um, what, creation, what community relationships are needed, how do you get that intersection between academia, which is like 2,000 years old, and open source, which has been around for not that long, <laughs> and, and, and more, okay. And the, the other purpose of the Teaching Open Source Group is to advocate for changes. Okay? Originally, we had a, a wiki and a planet and a mailing list and an IRC channel, and there was also a monthly conference call. Currently, there's, 
we've maintained the mailing list and there is a um, there's a website that has teaching material and we'll give you an update on that um, in a bit here. So the people that, that took on the effort at the beginning were a combination of people from academia, Chris Tyler and David Humphrey from Seneca College. Um, and they, they were foundational in establishing the website for teachingopensource.org. Mel Chua and Greg de Konigsberg and, Har and Harish Pillay, like all who were at Red Hat, were also responsible for pushing forth the teaching open source effort. So it was a nice mix of people from the academic side of the house and people from, from, open to, from a clearly open source organization. Okay. One of the very early efforts there was to try to educate faculty. And so Red Hat originally proposed a professor's open source summer experience. Okay. And the summer experience was intended to be an immersive experience for faculty. It was a week long. Um, to get faculty up to speed on open source culture and technology. The secondary goal of teaching open source was to grow the community, to gain more instructors who were familiar with open source and who wanted to teach open source. So that first professor's open source summer experience began as an outreach by Red Hat. And um, Greg and I actually went to the first one. <laughs> So, and it was, it was fun. It was a week long Im, uh, immersion where faculty members came together and they basically worked on an open source project, went through the steps that you typically would take to contribute to an open source project. And so you became accustomed to the community. You understood how the cultures worked. You understood about the issue tracker and how to issue a pull request and, and so forth. Most of these were held on university campuses with a mostly local audience. Um, and there was funding for lunch and maybe dinner, but not a lot of funding for things like travel to get to the, to the actual event. Okay. And this just shows you, it, it was very much an international effort. You can see here, we were in the US, but we were just about as often not in the US as, as the events were held in the US. Okay, So the very first one was in Raleigh at Red Hat headquarters, and then it went to Singapore and Doha. Um, Worcester State University hosted one in 2010. Carl Worst is a, is a current teaching open source um, um, community coordinator member. Okay, uh, And some of you may know Steve Jacobs. He's also very active in the teaching open source world, and he has hosted two of those um, of the posse experiences. So posse worked very well as an immersive experience. The piece that was missing was how do I take all this great stuff I've learned and communicate it to my students? I can't replicate a week long immersive experience with my students in the classroom. So how do I then convey the culture, the technologies to my students. So in the um, in 2012, Greg and I got together and said, let's see if we can build on Red Hat's posse. So what we did was we applied for some funding, and this was our some of our first NSF funding to create a posse version two. We front end loaded the experience with six weeks of online work where faculty completed some exercises online and we had three virtual meetings to start to create community and to answer questions and to get people involved. And the goal here was to use some of that NSF funding to actually transport faculty and be able to support them as they learned. Okay. So the second phase was two and a half days where we got together in person. It, we covered open source culture and teaching strategies, and we had lots of fun. It, we built community members that we are still in contact with. Okay. Um, and frequently these were held either at um, Red Hat, very kindly hosted multiple posses. Um, they were also hosted on university campuses, uh, again, to try to manage costs. Um, and Google also funded one that we held uh, in Bologna. So we've had 12 since 20, 
13, we've got over 175 faculty members that have gone through from 150 different institutions. That's not coming from one funding source. NSF has kindly funded us um, multiple times now uh, to run POSSEs. So this just gives you an idea of where the, where the POSSEs were run, okay? Um, and we ran one as recently as 2022 in Garden City. So the one that was in uh, San Francisco, we held at Google offices and Google also provided some funding so that we ran one in Bologna, okay? which was wonderful. We had people from, I think, four or five different continents at the, at the one in Bologna. So, okay. And this is just a picture that shows you uh, might be our first posse, not, or one of our very early posses. Um, and it was held at Drexel in Philadelphia. And you can see the smiles on people's faces. People were excited to be participating. So a lot of what Heidi gave is sort of the history of how we got to where we are. And what you have to understand is we've been doing this now for well over a decade. Uh, it turns out that teaching open source is not an easy problem to solve. And there's, um, we're still working on how to do that. You know, we sort of started off with our own efforts to say, well, could we really get students involved in an open source project? And the answer was, yes, we could. And I was like, well, what would, what would faculty need to teach open source? We started to develop the teaching materials. For faculty, we came up with the posse approach, you know, in, in conjunction with Red Hat. Um, and what we found was a lot of faculty would be really excited about open source. They would really be interested in it. They don't know anything about it themselves necessarily coming in, but they saw the potential and the value of teaching it to students, but they had a really hard time doing that. Uh, and they still have a hard time doing that. So some of the stuff I'm going to talk about really has to do with how do you make it easier for faculty that like the idea and that are interested in doing this to actually go ahead and, and insert it in their courses. Um, for people that live in the open source world, and sometimes I find myself a little surprised by this, but people are surprised that students don't understand open source. We, we have taken in the last five years or so to um, doing surveys of students and asking them about open source and what they understand of different questions to see what they understand about open source. They don't understand anything. They, they know it's there. They know they can get software for free and it's legal to do so. But how, so, how open source actually works, the whole notion of open source culture, the whole notion of there being communities that work on open source, the corporate contribution to open source, especially in more recent years, they are just clueless. You know, they think it's some small thing on the side that's done by volunteers on the weekends. They don't understand the extent to which it really impacts the industry that they're headed for. So we're trying to figure out how to deal with all of this and, and still trying to move TOS forward. We think that's a good vehicle. Uh, one of the things we've done, as Heidi mentioned, we've gotten successive grants from National Science Foundation, and they're still interested in, in supporting what we do. Uh, but we were also interested in getting funding from groups like Google. Heidi mentioned we've gotten some, some funding from Google to support Posse. So in order to, to support that, <laughs> we wanted a neutral platform for TOS. So um, the Soul for Freedom Conservancy was kind enough to take us on as one of their sponsored projects. So we now can use that as it's not any one institution, but it, it's a separate organization uh, that's neutral that we can use as a, as a way to, to get funding from Google or other organizations as well. Um, there's another element here that hasn't come out clearly that I'm going to talk about, and that is that we have specifically added computing for social good, even from the very early days in what we've done. Um, we've done computing for social good as, as a part of that. So, so TOS, the original idea of TOS really came, as Heidi said, from the open source community. It was an outreach effort. And um, we immediately, as when we got involved, we immediately saw the value of having students engage with, with open source in order to teach them software engineering education. Um, pretty much by accident, our initial exposure to open source had to do with a project called Sahana, which is a disaster relief project. Um, and, and we immediately started to think about the, the impact of students being exposed to um, a humanitarian project as a part of what they did. And we noticed right away as we started to do Posse, as we started to get additional students engaged in open source, that students and also faculty were particularly drawn to, drawn to the humanitarian projects. So that was a whole additional layer of value from an educational perspective that we didn't have when we first started with, if you just start with the notion of teaching open source. You don't lose any of the value of teaching students open source. You know, a humanitarian project 
and the way it operates and the philosophy it has and the culture of open source is very similar to any other open source project. But it adds this whole additional effort of getting students to think about computing for social good, to think about social responsibility of computing professionals and so on. And that also has extended now even more because we noticed that in particular, all students like the humanitarian nature of the projects we tend to deal with, but that women and some other underrepresented groups were even more excited than, than other students about the humanitarian aspect. And we've done research and there's been other research related to computing for social good that shows that um, women and some underrepresented groups, Hispanic students, for instance, tend to really resonate with social good applications of computing. Um, and it, as you may know, we don't have enough women and, and, and underrepresented groups are, are underrepresented <laughs> in computing, right? So, so in trying to, ex, ex, to attract more students to computing, doing something that helps to increase diversity, helps to make computing more inclusive is a really desirable outcome. So the approach we've taken to TOS in particular is to sort of focus the educational outreach on humanitarian-based projects. So students get the software engineering learning, they learn about open source, and they do it in the context where they're learning about computing for social good as well. So that's kind of where we are now, right? We've, we've got our original te teaching open source community. There's still a website and learning materials associated with that. We've still got our, our professional outreach, which is still posse. Uh, and we do this now under the sponsorship of the uh, Software Freedom Conservancy to give us a, uh, a neutral platform as a basis for the efforts. Uh, we've also extended the number of institutions that are involved. As Heidi said, we've had about 150 different institutions send faculty to Posse, but there are a smaller number, some of the key ones are, are listed here, a smaller number that are heavily involved where we have people who are actively um, teaching courses or using in their existing courses, teaching open source as a part of what they do. And also these are the, the sites where we have people who are, are actually helping us to teach the Posse professional development workshops. And we could double this number if you look at people that have come to Posse and gotten involved with us and gone back and they're teaching a course or they've done studies and publications to try and propagate this idea um, across computing education. Um, there's a whole, whole bunch beyond this. These are kind of the core people that actually help work on Posse and work on the TOS website and contribute educational materials and so on. So as Heidi said, if you think about TOS, if you go Google teachingopensource.org, what you find is a, is a website, which these days is, is a wiki. Um, there's a whole bunch of materials out there for teaching, including a few courses. So we're trying to support um, academics who want just to be able to pick up an activity uh, or a series of activities to, to teach their students. It always is easier for somebody to get going if they can be handed existing course materials. So we're always constantly trying to build. We're always out of date. You know, we always have stuff that we haven't posted yet and so on. But, but we do have a good set of materials. And we, we hear from people who come to Posse that, um, that they pick up those materials and take them back to their classes and actually use them. Uh, we're still working on the problem, though, of, of how to get people to actually get open source into their courses. Uh, and there's a variety of things that we've done to try and address that. Uh, I'll talk about some of those in the in the next couple of slides, but we're still trying to find the right combination of support, scaffolding, help for faculty, community for faculty, to help make it easier for them to get open source into their community. Uh, I didn't mention this term, but I'll mention it here. We, we refer to HFOS, the project like Sahana, the disaster relief project that, that we've, we've gotten students involved with. Uh, there's a whole category of projects in that area, computing for social good, open source projects. And you'll see the word HFOS tossed around, humanitarian, free, and open source software, uh, to cover that, that group of projects. So one of the problems with, with people teaching open source is faculty members will hear about what we do. They'll get all excited. Maybe they'll come to Posse. And then they have trouble actually getting what they want to teach into the curriculum. Classroom hours, as Heidi mentioned, classroom hours are scarce. The, the, the interesting problems with curriculum are always not what are you going to teach, it's what are you going to leave out, because right? there's never enough hours. And if you think about the rapid evolution of computing, that creates a tremendous amount of pressure on faculty. Right? In the last year or two years, it's been all about how are we going to cover AI and machine learning. Right? Before that, you know, it was how are we going to cover cybersecurity stuff. And there's always some new hot topic that has a certain number of years where it's the topic. But they don't go away after that. 
you know so there's always this problem of how do we how do we manage a computing curriculum uh, and cover the topics we want to cover hours are scarce and hours are fiercely competed for so it's difficult um, for faculty to get time in a course sometimes faculty have control of a course and they just start doing open source there but a lot of times they don't and so they we will have people come to posse they'll go home all excited and three years later they'll, they'll get in touch with it and say oh i finally got a chance to do something with this in one of my courses or we'll meet somebody at a conference two or three years later and they'll say yeah i really want to do that but i can't find the room so we're always trying to figure out how to make this work for faculty and help them fit it into their existing curriculum which is often the case there are situations drexel for instance we have a course now called open source software engineering so it's dedicated to this to this area many institutions the faculty that are interested can't pull that off they can't convince other faculty that they need to do this um, nonetheless you know as we see more and more institutions starting to do this we are continually convinced and continually get feedback from faculty about the huge benefits of teaching students open source even though it isn't happening and nearly as broadly as we wish it was you know but a lot of the learning we started off with software engineering learning Right? But, but a lot of this isn't really about programming or algorithms or traditional computer science topics. It, it, it has much more impact in terms of helping students understand the profession that they're getting into and develop a lot of the skills they're actually going to need on the job. Understanding of how software engineering really works, how a team works, how they communicate, how they track their work, how they apportion the work among the team, how they do any kind of planning. And open source projects are amazing as vehicles for students to see that in action. And other than open source, it's very hard, if you're teaching software engineering, it's very hard to motivate students as to why they have to do all the things we encourage them to do in software engineering until they see it at scale, until they see complexity of a real product, until they see products that have history and future. You know, not just, well, we're writing a program now, but we're working on a large code base that has a 10-year history and all these things that have happened to it, all these people that have worked on it, and it's got plans for the future. How do we make all that work in the context of where we are today? So all those sorts of issues are amazing to be able to teach students and very difficult if you're a faculty member in an isolated class and you don't have open source to draw on it's really difficult to motivate students it's really difficult to prepare the sort of work environments and examples that they need in order to really understand and then work with real scale real complexity projects and open source provides a huge opportunity to do all of those things and it changes the way students think about this we have you know situation after situation where some students said oh I really didn't understand what software engineering was about. Now I do. Oh, now I understand why we have to do all this GitHub stuff or this GitLab stuff. You know, now I understand. Now I've seen how teams work. You know, now I understand why it matters to write a good issue if you if you find a bug. Because I've tried I've read other people's issues and said, well, there's a bug, I think, but I don't even know what it is and I can't understand what I'm supposed to do. They get all that kind of experience. So that's kind of the prize that's difficult to reach. For instructors, Heidi made reference to a lot of the limitations, a lot of the difficulties and hurdles that, um, that instructors have. But when we talk to instructors who actually take, take a pass at this, they find working with open source really impactful on how they teach. They get inspired by it. We've had people who say, oh, this has just re-energized my teaching to be able to get students engaged with open source. Uh, it also helps them to change the way they think about who they are and what their role in the course is and what they should be doing with students. Um, they start to be more flexible about student learning. You know, if, you're, if you have students working on an open source project, things are a little less predictable than if they're working on canned exercises in a class. And so the instructor has to be a little more flexible about how they guide the students, how they evaluate what the student's doing. We've had instructors say, oh, this has really increased my confidence. It surprises people outside of computing education, but many instructors have never worked as software engineers. They've gone right through academic programs. They have some specialty area of research. They have deep expertise in some area of computing. But a lot of them have never actually been software engineers. So trying to teach students how to be software engineers or how to work in a team 
a lot of them will say, oh, this, this, this posse thing and working with some open source projects has really increased my own confidence in being able to explain to students and teach students what they should do. They also find themselves shifting from the stage, say sage on the stage to the guide on the side approach to teaching and being more open to dealing with new technologies, being more open to going with students to places where they are not the expert and they don't understand exactly what's going on, and they start to understand that it, it's a valuable thing for a faculty member to model, okay, we don't know what we're doing here, we're stuck, we're, we have a problem, how do we solve the problem? Most faculty members are way better at solving those problems than they may give themselves credit for before they roll into this. And they start to understand that they're not gonna teach the students the material that they need to solve the problem. What they're gonna do instead is help guide the students through, through problem solving and developing problem solving skills. So there's a lot of really large impacts on instructors, uh, which can be difficult for some instructors in some instructional situations, but also many instructors have come back to us and said, oh, this has been so good. It's changed the way I teach. It's changed the way I do students. It's re-energized me on my teaching. I really like it. But it's a hard hill to climb in order to get there. And so over the years, we've come to the value and realize that the value of, of us providing, the TOS community, providing support for instructors. Right. We've had instructors say things like this. If I was on my own and I tried to do TOS, I would have given up. You know, but because I met other people at Posse and I know other people on TOS, um, I, can, I can talk to other faculty and it gives me the, some of the help and also just some of the uh, motivation to work through it on my own. Um, we also, as I said, find that, that instructors do actually use material. We're always looking for new materials and trying to develop new materials to help instructors be able to pick up the right piece for their course and use it to teach their students. There's a more general thing that we see, and that is the instructors become open source fans, right? They become part of the open source world. And, and people have said to me, yeah, I'm teaching the open source stuff from Posse over in this course, but then I teach this other course on algorithms or on databases or on something. And they say, well, as soon as I'm picking up a new course, I'm thinking, wow, how could I use open source over here? You know, and, they, and they understand that they can weave it in as a source of useful uh, material and examples and exposure for students in almost anything that they teach, which is great because we think it ought to be part of what is taught in almost every course, but most faculty have, have not gotten there yet. So long term, we want open source fluent students. Um, we've been working on it, as I said, for a long time. Uh, and we find it's, it's hard to get there for all these reasons that we just mentioned. Um, <clears throat> definitely, we have to be focusing on not just the students and teaching the students, but we have to focus on the faculty and teaching the instructors because they don't know. Uh, we find that when we go into a group of faculty, even today, that there'll be most of the many faculty in the room won't know GitLab or GitHub. They know it's there. They don't really understand how to use it. They won't know other kinds of tools. They won't even understand a lot about open source necessarily uh, and in depth. So we have, to, we have to take care of the instructors, bring them along, do things like Posse, but also have communities on an ongoing basis that support faculty and help them because it's not an easy transition for faculty to make either. So that's the end. We're hoping to have some time for some interesting discussion. Uh, we've just got some of the people that have, have helped us along the way, uh, Posse and all these other groups have had something to do with funding or providing support or providing help or sending people to Posse to talk to, to folks or uh, making people available on TOS to deal with faculty and help them along as well. <clears throat> so shall we switch to questions? Heidi, did you have anything you wanted to add? Okay. All right, well, thank um, you so much. That was a fascinating presentation. Um, I have to admit, even though I've been in open source for a long time, um, I was not aware of the Posse workshops. So um, I'm curious how you get the word out about those and when they're happening and if they're, you know, do you, is it like a cohort base where you um, have a particular group at an institution or maybe a few interested folks and then you run a cohort or is it um, where you schedule them out in advance and just sort of get the word out and let people sign up? Uh, we've done both of those. We've, we've done it at particular locations. Um, we've also just done it where we get the word out and people sign up and we have people from a bunch of different institutions. Right. Uh, we yeah, mostly reach Patrick out to the computers, computing education 
communities, right? The uh, ACM, SIGC, right. um, Special Interest Group in Community Science Education. We mostly reach out to those kind of venues. If you have any better ideas. Let um, some of our folks know, some of the folks in the Sakai community and in the wider sure. Aperio community know, because they may have faculty at their institutions that would really benefit from something like that, but they're just not, they don't know that it's available or when it's right. happening. So maybe if we could right. get maybe an Aperio group um, going for something like sure. that, I think that would be amazing. Yeah, that would be great. Um, another thing that people can do is, is whenever we bump into somebody, we, we say sign up for the TOS uh, email list. It's a low volume list, you know, one or two items a month kind of thing. It's very low volume. But we'll always announce, if we have an event like that, we'll always announce it on, on TOS. Excellent. Yeah, I will definitely start steering people to that list to get updated on announcements. Um, Patrick mentioned in the chat, and it kind of sparked an idea that I had as well. You mentioned that usually you, this is introduced to software development courses or people that are teaching software development. Are there other associated disciplines where you could see some you know, interest from faculty? I'm thinking about um, things like leadership courses or um, user experience course wor coursework, um, things like that that are kind of all part of that software development cycle, but maybe not um, as easily identifiable as like the development courses. Okay, so um, RIT has got um, in their, I think it's coming out of their gaming program actually, a minor in open source. And it's, its focus is on open source culture. Um, one of the things we emphasize in the Posse is you can approach open source from a whole variety of different directions. Things like open data and open government can, can be incorporated into classes. Um, and I've found that it plays fairly well with my colleagues in sociology, um, my colleagues in, in other disciplines, um, partly because of, actually a lot because of OER, open educational resources. And, and they, they are like, oh, it's free, oh, it's useful. And then they get into a better understanding of the openness. I'm not sure that answered the question. Yeah, I think so. I, I think um, there would be probably a lot of interest from folks that could see it as sort of a thread they could weave into their discipline, even if it's you know not a, a traditionally software development type of course. Um, I, think, I do see a couple other. The, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. One of the one of the hurdles is if we can't get computing folks educated as to what open source is. <laughs> trying to trying to educate non-technical people about something they view as being technical is is a little bit higher hurdle sometimes right yeah absolutely <laughs> um let's see i have a, there's a, a message in chat from uh, chandrika maris she's one of our maris qa folks um she wanted to thank you guys uh for uh sharing some of the um emphasis on the 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 teaching in, in open source, and she's going to share it with her colleagues. Um, and then Matthew um, asks, do you ask the, or do you find that participants, students, and faculty have existing fluency around open source licenses? And have you found that folded into the instruction and socialization around um, free and open source? Yeah, so, so IP, intellectual property questions are certainly something we address in Posse and most of the people that are teaching open source, it's one of the topics they, they address basics of uh, in their courses. Uh, what we generally find is students are completely clueless on that area. You know, students, students, and this is something I've surveyed, you know, I'm talking about junior, senior students. Um, they think if something's a public repo on GitHub or GitLab, that it's open source. They have no concept that there should be a license associated with it, much less what licenses um, they might want to look for and, you know, what the implications of different licenses are, you know, free versus open and forget it. They, they know nothing about any of that. And, and my students, you know, I, I, Drexel is a co-op school. So I'm, when I talk junior or senior, I'm talking about students who are not only juniors or seniors in the academic program, but typically have a year's full-time work experience in addition to that. So there's so, a follow-up from Matthew. Um, he wants to know if there are any resources um, that you know of 
they're doing an especially good job of instructing around that licensing issue. There are some good right. copyright resources, for instance, um, even just what's posted by OSI. And um, if you just look at the, the material that OSI provides on the website and the Free Software Foundation provides, they're pretty, they're pretty readable, at least for a faculty member who wants to put something together. Um, and there are some, some good, you kind of have to pick and choose, but there are some good YouTube videos that different people have done about basics of copyright and licensing. Um, so that kind of material is available. It's not not really that hard to find. And I'm just Patrick. In... Patrick asks, uh, "What yeah. are some of the other significant knowledge gaps that you see in?" Uh... Oh Lord. Well, it starts with the fact they don't understand how open source works. They don't understand the open source community. They don't understand that you can get paid. They think it's all volunteer. You know, when you tell people, "Oh, these people have a career doing open source," they're like, "Really?" <laughs> and that I'm talking now high high majority of all students. Um, a lot of what I'm interested in in teaching students about open source really is not unique to open source, but it's just that open source is a really good vehicle for it. They don't understand how software is really developed by a team. They don't understand software product development uh, very well at all. And um, I will often do this, you know, I might have five teams of five in a class. One team will have a pretty good understanding of those topics. Another team or maybe two will have a little bit of understanding and then the other two or three are just clueless. They just have no idea how to work as a team in order to build software. So all the things that you have in a, in a current Git-based platform environment for software development, they, they know some of the mechanics of those things, but they don't really understand how you do anything with it as a team. I see Patrick has, has posted uh, one of the OSI links yeah those those are the that's one of the ones i was talking about and and free software foundation has their versions of, of that discussion too and you want to add anything about knowledge gaps no i just mentioned that i posted a video from uh, that we recorded of tom calloway who is the was the fedora license manager um, that he did for teaching right. open source um where do you where do you think posse and uh the the tos um ha, has been most successful and um what enabled that i guess i'd say i'd say two things one giving more faculty basic knowledge of um the fundamentals of open source you know, getting them started toward teaching um Second thing, closely related to that, so it's part of sort of the same same point, is giving giving faculty some some basic materials that they can they can pick up and use without having to develop something from scratch. And then the other piece is community, you know, that it has put faculty in touch with each other who are interested in this issue and trying to figure out how to solve it. Uh, and and it, one of one of the most fun things was going to a computing education, computer science education conference, and seeing a panel that had five people talking about teaching open source and none of them were from our core team and they all were people who had gone to Posse and then gone back and done something and gotten together with each other and done a panel at a conference. You know, it's like seeing your children grow up. Um, but all of a sudden they're out, you know, doing things on their own. And, and so, so those I think are some of the, some of the real positives. I, maybe I should mention another thing that we haven't had time to talk about. Uh, and that is in our quest to try and make this reachable for faculty. Uh, in recent last couple of years, we've, we've been trying something different, which is we have started some small open source projects, which are faculty controlled. And most of the contributions are done by students. So one of these um, is a project called Open Energy Dashboard, which is, um, it's a, it takes in uh, mostly uh, data from things like uh, electric meters, and um, we'll give you a dashboard view of electrical consumption on a college campus. So you can try and work on reducing your carbon footprint. And it's, it's, um, it, it's all student, student and faculty built. Um, it's actually in use on a handful of college campuses. So it's a real project with, with actual clients. Um, but, it, but it's because of the student and faculty involvement, there's a, a clear understanding that part of what we're trying to do there is use it as a basis for vehicle for education. Um, there's another project called Farm Data 2 that one of our team members at Dickinson College has been building. It, it's, um, it's software to run a small organic farm. 
do the record keeping and analysis for that. Right? So there's, there's a, a series of projects we've started up and we're hoping to expand those as a way to give faculty a project that's more approachable, um, that is clearly education oriented as, as a part of its reason for existence, but is still a, um, a, an actual open source project with actual clients. And I'm participating in Libre Food Pantry, which is an umbrella organization that is developing software to support uh, on-campus food pantries. And you might think, well, they all work the same, but they don't. <laughs> so at Western New England, we need to track each item that comes in and leaves the food pantry. Worcester State University, which is another participant, they actually track food usage by weight. And uh, we're also building one at Nassau Community College and Simmons University in Boston. And so we have four projects that are all building food pantry software. And what we found is that building collaboratively is um, we're, we're standing on each other's shoulders as we go forward. Uh, Western New England is, we were hoping to deploy, we couldn't quite get it deployed this semester. What we got were able to deploy, we were only able to deploy because we were building on code that Worcester State University students had developed, that they had developed based on code that Western New England had originally started on. So what we're starting to see here is a, um, I think there might be a 60 paper in here somewhere, but collaborative learning both across the faculty and the students where the students are jointly learning together in that environment. And it's very cool to see each other, to see that happen. So the idea here is to give something that is, is more easily reachable for faculty. It loses some of the large scale of, of a big open source project and the, and the large community of a big open source project. But it does provide an open source project with um, that has some open participation and real clients and you know ongoing effort over a period of years. So we've also been exploring something we refer to as a kit, which is a learning activity. But the idea is to use, uh, it started off, first we were thinking VMs, and then it became containers, and now um, we're starting to use Gitpod. But it's a, it's a packaged environment. Uh, and what, what we do inside that environment, let's say the container version, um, is it, it, we, take a, we take an entire open source project and we put it in the container. So this is not just the code, but it's also um, the GitLab environment for the project. So there's a, um, a tracker in there that has, you know, issued an issue tracker that has all the history of the project and, and students can actually operate on the project, but they're not operating on the real project. They're operating on a copy of a real project, which the instructor can control and can reset and restart because it lives in a container. And then we have um, actual lessons and activities that go along with, with that container. So it's a way to give give faculty members a real environment, but a copy of the real world environment that they can actually control. So we're basically trying to build, you know, small steps that faculty can take without just jumping into a large, what we refer to as um, as open source in the wild, you know, a large open source project um, that's that's operated on by a large, potentially large community. Oh, that's very cool. I see Chandrika typing. That's just a thank you. <laughs> okay, um, so I'll go ahead and ask uh, Patrick's question. Um, are the initiatives like NSF's Posse Grants and the emergence of academic OSPOs helping to grow interest in um, in this area? I think some. Um, I, I guess the, 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 I'd, I'd turn that around a little bit and say, to some extent, the problem isn't interest. The problem is the inhibitors that faculty face in trying to do this. You know, their own learning curve, the, the, how impossibly hard it is sometimes to get something new into a curriculum. I think those are the bigger limitations at the moment. Um, people in the computer science education community know about POSSE and they know about um, teaching students about TOS, you know, and, and there's a fair amount of interest in it. So I, I don't think getting more interest is really the problem. It's 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 overcoming the other barriers, the other inhibitors that, that faculty face. Well, and I think and I think building community. So NSF funded posses up to a point, and we, we no longer have NSF funding to fund local posses. 
And that's, I think, had an impact on our ability to, to widen our community in that I, getting people together face to face really makes a difference where they can learn who somebody is, feel like they've made a contact, have somebody that they can actually ask questions to. So when, when they hit a bump or they have a question about how to go about doing something, they, they've, got a, they've got a community there. And I think ha having more processes broaden that community. Okay, well, we've got about three minutes. Um, do you guys have any closing remarks, marks, or any you know takeaways that you would like to, to share with our audience? We are always looking for more materials for teaching open source. So if you have materials that you would like to contribute, uh, simply contacting one of us would be great. Um, we're going to hopefully start working on that now that school is over <laughs> and start trying to, to expand the offerings in our, for our teaching materials. So if you know of something, please let us know. And it occurred right. to me, we didn't, I'm not sure that we put our email addresses on the actual slides. So my email address is just Ellis, my last name, E-L-L-I-S, at wne.edu. That's the easy one. And mine's the same, last name, H-I-S-L-O-P, yeah, at drexel.edu. And it looks like Jen uh, is typing those into the chat. Mm -hmm. So Great. Yeah. Great. Great. Well, thank you so much. Um, this has been a, a terrific uh, session. I really appreciate you both uh, giving your time to educate us a little bit about this program and maybe spur some additional interest in, in getting another cohort going if we can. Um, and definitely I, I will spread the word about the listserv to the folks in my open source community for um, those that are not already aware. I think they could find it a really valuable resource. So um, thank you Thanks. again. And thank you to, um, to Patrick and Jen for helping uh, pull all this together. And thank you all of you who attended today for, um, for joining us.